Welcome to the Caribbean Moms Podcast with me, your host, Empress Golding. Over the course of this series, our guests will be providing Caribbean mothers with expert advice, support, and conversation around the everyday challenges of raising children. Most of all, we're here to celebrate moms who are doing the most important job in the world. The CaribbeanMoms.com podcast is brought to you by Lactogen 3 for a healthy and happy tummy. Lactogen 3, grow happy. Lactogen 3 is not a breast milk substitute. It is suited to young children from one year onward. And remember, breastfeeding is best. In this episode, we're going to talk about sleep hacks for your little ones. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Caribbean Moms. I am Empress Golding, your host, and I am a mom. And I have two children, and I know when it comes to sleep, mom is lacking sleep and the children lack sleep. So today in this episode, we want to look at sleep with our sleep consultant expert, pediatric sleep consultant, Kristen Giefer. Welcome, Kristen. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Tell me about you. Are you a mom? <sighs> so yes, I'm a mom. I have two little girls. They're six and four. And from day one, I love my sleep. So I knew I had to get them to sleep. So they even could be interviewed now to tell you exactly what they need to do to get sleep. That's how bad I am. <laughs> All right. So tell me what it was like for you when you, you know, you gave birth to your first daughter and what were the challenges you saw with sleep for mom and sleep for your children? So I grew up in Jamaica. So I know my family has always really valued sleep. You know, they're like, go take a nap, go lay down, go rest. Like it's very important versus, you know, in America, everyone's go, 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 go. And they think you're lazy if you're lying down for a minute. So I knew that I was going to instill that in my children. So from pregnancy with the first one, I bought all the books and I'm in the bed with my belly, reading to my husband every night, making sure we're on the same page. This is what we're going to implement. And we have to do this. And do you understand it's all based on science now and, and on and on and on. And, you know, all the generations behind us are all like, that's craziness. You know, the child will just sleep. Don't worry about it. And I understood that it was a science. So I gave birth to my first one and I instilled it from day one. Day one, I was in there implementing everything I had learned. And what are some of the things that you learned, Kristen? What did they tell you? What did you read? What worked? So I, I didn't realize just how scientific it is. And of course, they're not robots, but there are so many things that you can do to implement good sleep that have nothing to do with sleep. So like their environment, when they eat, what they eat, how much are they eating, um, what to look for when they're tired, how long can they really be awake for? Those are all things that we now know through studies. So I was able to track what she was doing and troubleshoot accordingly based on all those different things. I mean, sometimes she just needed to eat more. Sometimes she just needed the room a little darker. Sometimes her temperature was off. And so I had learned all these various other things that affect sleep, which was fascinating to me. Mm. I mean, even to us, right? We need certain things. Yeah. And I think it's important we identify some of the, the uh, symptoms or some of the behaviors that our children have and then look at how do we address that. But first, let me ask you, how much sleep should my baby be getting at different development milestones? So um, according to the Sleep Foundation, I think a lot of people don't realize how much sleep their child needs. I mean, if you're a newborn, you should be sleeping like 14 to 17 hours. That does not leave a lot of wake time. And if you are an infant, which, you know, you're in the first year, maybe four months to a year, you should be having 12 to 15 hours. So you're still sleeping a huge chunk. And as it goes on, it obviously, you know, you need less sleep up to, you know, teenage years where you can manage on like eight or 10, which is still a lot more than people think. 
Um, but for those first few years, it is a majority of their day. And when I end up training children correctly and, you know, altering their schedule, the parents are like, why are they still sleeping? And I'm like, that's what they're supposed to be doing. You are robbing them of their sleep before. So it is fascinating to realize they should only be awake a few hours a day in those early months. Mm -hmm. And what times should they be awake in the night, in the morning? Should they be mimicking our mom sleep pattern? For the most part, if your pediatrician shows you that the growth is healthy and everything is going well um, with the baby's weight, um, and I get signed off on that, I can cut out night feeds from four months old, which is 16 weeks. So they could be sleeping 12, 13 hours at four months old. And that is my goal for families that don't need that night feed, which means they can, at 16 weeks, you could be sleeping through the night with your child, which is amazing. Um, but if the pediatrician, you know, thinks, still thinks there needs to be feeds, then I coordinate their night sleep during certain intervals of, you know, at six hours after last feed, they can eat. Five hours after that, they can eat again. So it's also orchestrated on a time routine. But for the most part, the night sleep can be achieved there. If you, you know, factor in all the things that they need, you can get back to your normal sleep patterns quickly. All right. What are you seeing with some of the moms that you have trained as it relates to, you know, the baby's behavior? What are the moms saying? And then take me through the process of you actually training these babies to sleep. Okay. So a lot of the mothers are tired because you can do it for so long, you know, until your body is kind of like, I just can't anymore. And you're crying and you're feeling depressed and you're feeling defeated. And I, you, it, the funny thing is I turn a lot of families away who I don't think are tired enough because I don't think they will commit. So the moms have come to me and sometimes they're like, you know, um, I'm feeling really good, but I want to start the training. So I have a schedule and I'm like, mm, you don't sound tired. You know, when, when you're putting your deodorant on your toothbrush, call me, that means you're tired. <laughs> um, so they've come crawling back, you know, oh my gosh, I'm so ready. I can't manage. And I'm like, now you're ready. So a lot of the moms, um, call, who call me or email or reach out are, are at the, the brink, like they're rock bottom. And that's when I will let them commit because I know that they're going to do it versus the ones that are having an easygoing time. So I wait to really hear them say, Kristen, I can't manage. Life has become unmanageable because then I know they have the will to work. And the process, so for instance, I was in Jamaica two weeks ago with a client and I, she had an in-home package. So she wanted me actually there because she was nervous and she, you know, she wanted the guidance. So I came to her home and stayed with her. Um, I do this locally as well and, you know, in different states around here, but I have never stayed over in the night because it was obviously international and I'm not going home. So um, I stayed with her. I sat with her when I arrived. I told her exactly what was going to happen. I had, you know, the whole page outlined and customized to her child, which is also something that you do virtually if I'm not there. And I break it down, I tell, explain the science because I find that my clients, if they understand why their child is doing something, they're like, oh, okay, that makes it better. But at 3 a.m. when you're like frantic and you don't know why they're crying or what they need or what to do, you feel completely lost. So my goal is to take that away. So you're like, oh, I get what's happening now. Let me fix it by doing X, Y, Z. So I was there with her and we did everything together and I would instruct her now do this. Oh, that didn't work. Now do this, which is also what I do virtually to all my clients. So I'm there with you holding your hand. My specialty is live coaching. So I, you know, bring the phone with me everywhere. So if I teach you in real time, you will learn and you'll have results faster. So that's why um, having a coach is, you know, you can have a trainer, but you can work out by yourself. If you need a sleep coach, you just get the results a little quicker and you know, you're more on task. So I talk everyone through what will happen if they're ready to commit, we commit, I customize an entire plan for them. 
And then we, based on what package they purchase, they get a certain amount of time with me. And I am there. They say, baby woke up, baby's doing this. And I say, okay, now do this, do this in real time. So it's fantastic. And I love the connections because I have them, you know, coming back to say, well, now it's three months has passed and baby's doing this. And I'm there to say, okay, now you do this. So it's kind of like a lifelong friendship and I've built some great ones. So I love it. I love the whole process beginning to end. I love what you said, life coaching, because I, I always say a successful athlete has a coach. So if you want to be a successful mom and sleep better and have your child sleep better, then yeah, a coach I always is think important. of it like a trainer. I'm always yeah. like, you can work out by yourself, but if the trainer is telling you exactly what to do for you, then, mm -hmm. you know, customize to you. Yeah. Well, let's look at some sleep tips for babies. Um, let's talk first about swaddling, because mm -hmm. when I had my child and I watched my son who had a child before me and swaddling was very important for them and their baby slept swaddled and mine was like, get this thing off of me, get this mm -hmm. thing off of me. So babies are different, but let's look at swaddling as a technique that many persons speak of as the best way to get the newborn to sleep. What say you? Okay. so what I have to admit is the cultural difference I have seen um, in different countries versus America with the swaddling and so a lot of my Jamaican clients they always call me and tell me they don't like the swaddle and I'm like did they tell you that because you know they were just tucked in your belly very very tightly and they were fine so they love the swaddle and my my tip is if they're breaking out of it, that is when they need it the most because their moral reflex, which is the startle reflex, um, doesn't go away till five, six months. So your baby is going to be waking themselves up when you could have just swaddled it tighter to keep them in. So no baby wants to come out of a womb and be starfished on the crib and spread out. It just doesn't feel natural to them. Swaddling for myself was particularly hard because of those reasons. They, my baby loved to have one hand by the face and, and everything. And, I, I, you know, they would wake up in the night and I would go in and they'd be out of the swaddle. And I was like, that's because I didn't swaddle tight enough. If I would have done that, they wouldn't have woken because of the startle. So I found this great blanket called the Miracle Blanket and it's on Amazon. And I recommend it to every client I have because it makes it kind of dummy proof. You can figure out how to do it and it keeps them like a burrito. There's just no way they can come out. And using that alone has helped so many families who are struggling with the baby waking up constantly and saying they don't like the swaddle. And I'm like, well, now you're doing it right. And you notice a change in the sleep because it is scary to them. It's like us when we dream and feel like we're falling. Yeah. That's what they have constantly. So unless they're in a little straight jacket, for lack of a better word, they're, they're going to wake up. That's just another thing that you want. You know, there's a checklist. Do this, 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 this to get them to sleep. One of them is if you can X out that moral reflex, do it. That's one less thing you have to worry about. So I always insist that people spend the time to learn how to swaddle or get a blanket like that that does it for you. That's interesting because even the Caribbean, a lot of our countries are hot and some people have babies mm -hmm. and they don't, they have really hot environments. Does the baby get hot? What if the baby is sweating? What kind of material would you recommend yes, for yes. the, the- And that is the big cultural question. Yeah. And a lot of my Jamaican clients, like they love the stomach sleeping, which gives me a heart attack. What's and that? The baby's lying on their stomach. Let's look at yes. that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So a lot of my Jamaican clients do that to me. And it's funny because when they call me, they, they kind of are like, ah, so I have to tell you. And I'm like, yes, because, you know, studies have shown that's obviously not what you're supposed to do until they can go on there themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll say, can I still do it? Because they really love that. And I'm like, it's on you. I you if you're going to do it, you do it. Even in the ho Jamaican house that I was just in. She said, you know, she likes to like sleep on her stomach. I said, you go put her on her stomach. I'm not going to be responsible because I'm so into the safety and the SIDS. And so much of that happens because of the lack of education in developing countries, in, you know, other places that don't push this sleep safety. 
let's let's i want to let's pick up on the swaddle um at the type of material you recommend and then i really want to talk for a minute about sleeping on the stomach and the fact that it has been proven that it, it can be very unsafe as a Correct. sleeping position for children so for the swaddling in in uh, countries that have a, a um you know a hotter temperature temperature mm -hmm. what should the material be for muslin. Yeah. muslin light muslin and even if you are not doing the entire body at least try to keep the torso wrapped mm -hmm. um, in something light that will keep the arms together and the baby on their back okay all right so hotter climates we use the muslin cloth to swaddle yeah. and i think it takes a lot of practice though but as Kristen said we got to keep it nice and snug so that nice they can't get out they shouldn't yeah. be breaking out exactly and now let's look at this thing called sids the sudden infant death syndrome and sleeping positions that are unsafe for babies so many persons like to put their baby on the stomach and you say no 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 until they can get there themselves and go back and forward, great. Mm -hmm. If you put a, you know, a newborn baby on their stomach and they don't have neck control and they're struggling to breathe, I mean, there's really nowhere for them to go. So, but I mean, that's just a lot of countries don't have education, you know, postpartum baby classes or whatever, you know, so you don't really, you just do the best you can wherever mm -hmm. you, what education you have. And so, Stomach is a big one. I don't care once they roll back and forth, do whatever they want, wherever they want to sleep, they will find what's comfortable. But definitely having things in the crib is another thing. You don't need a pillow and a blanket and all those various things because they don't have the control to move away from them. Once they do, go for it. But I mean, I don't recommend blankets until at least like one or pillows, maybe two, because until they know what to do with them, why would they need one, you know? Mm. Excellent advice there. So we're going to keep our babies on their back, on their backs. We're going to keep our babies on their backs. Let's look now at uh, something that I have heard newborn or a new mom say that their newborn should have tea before six months. They should be drinking tea, mint tea, ginger what? tea. <laughs> Uh, please help me with that. And some say it's good for them for sleeping. What say you, Kristen? I say that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. My husband is a pediatric GI specialist, so he helps me on the nutrition end. They don't need anything. They need their milk, and that is it. Do not give them a bottle of water. They do not need it. Especially Jamaicans, I know my mother did it to me, gave me a bottle of ice water when I was little to drink water, and my husband says it has zero nutritional value. All you need is the milk, no tea. You don't want any herbs or remedies to be in their system. They don't need those kind of things and they don't want those kind of things. If your baby needs to sleep, find another way. Sorry, no tea. I've never heard that. No. I've heard that one. Okay, no tea for the baby, especially before uh, their six it. months. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what about this routine now? Like what, what, mm. what does a typical routine look like for a child to have the 14 to 17 hours of sleep that they need that they need are we supposed to be following the clock that we use 6 a.m is wake up uh, six o'clock is bedtime how does it work for a newborn a so, typical routine healthy okay. routine so for not only newborns but for children up to maybe two you never go by the clock you go by their sleep pressure, which is the amount of time that their body and age can be awake for. So as a, for example, a newborn should only be awake for 45 minutes, max 60 before they're sleeping again, because the sleep pressure builds up in them. Once it's popped, your baby is overtired, they're exhausted and they get into that manic stage where you're like walking around bouncing, and you can't seem to soothe them, that's, that's overtired. Now you'll have to wait for your sleep pressure to build back up. So no, you're not looking at the clock. Sometimes I have clients, I say, when does your child nap? And they say, oh, at 10 and two. And I was like, well, why did you pick 10 and two? And they're like, I don't know, it just seemed like a good time. And I'm like, your baby's awake for four hours, they should be awake for 45 minutes. That's, that's you know, that's why you're getting the grumpy baby. 
Um, so especially for newborns, you have to be on the clock. And so you're on the wake times. You're not looking at, you know, 7 p.m. People say, should I wake them at seven? Should I wake them at eight? Nap them at two, nap them at three. And there's the science behind it that says, no, it's us, it's how much they can be awake for. And obviously that, you know, grows as, you know, they say, my child's always sleeping now. And I'm like, well, you know, the to wake times will get longer, but that is your special sauce and your special remedy and what you hire a sleep coach for to tell you the times for your child. And if you get them right, the child will love the sleep and be ready for it. Interesting. So you're saying we have to train them to sleep. If a baby, a newborn is up for two, three hours, then something is wrong. Yes, they were and not soothed to sleep. And that's where you're, what you were saying, the routine comes in. Mm. So the routine is for them and it is for cue. It's used to teach them the cues. So they now hear, they, they hear the white noise or the fan or whatever it is that's going to drown out your noise. They see the curtains close. It's now dark. They get a warm bath. They get their feed. They're now laying in this crib. And those are all cues that they will turn and say, oh, okay, I know what's coming now. It's bed. And so it's more of an instructional tool for them. It's lovely for you because, you know, you, you go through the same thing every night and you know what to expect and they know what grow to know what to expect. And it makes it simpler at bedtime. Nap routine is just a shortened version. So obviously they don't need to do the bath and this and that. Um, but you do the kind of the same things every time. And they sometimes they learn. And, you know, I have kids that bring their sleep sack to their parents now and say, OK, I'm ready because they know that is my sleep cue. Um, so they learn it quick. They are much smarter than we give them credit for at that age, but they figure it out very fast. Interesting. And what about the white noise that you mentioned? I know they have a lot of apps for it. And you mentioned mm -hmm. the fan. Some moms mm -hmm. get up and say, oh my God, I need to get in the car with the baby and drive. And they drive their baby around the block a couple of times until the baby that falls was me. asleep. I was driven. <laughs> I've done that too. I've done yep. that too. So it and works. Do whatever, you, do whatever you need. I tell moms, they're always embarrassed when they call and say, well, you know, I bounced them for an hour. And then and I'm like, I don't care like that. You're surviving. Um, yes. The white noise is important because it calms your brain activity. So a lot of um, misconceptions about like playing lullabies and music. I had a client that called for a consult and the only thing she needed was me to tell her not to play music and it was solved. She was like, oh, I've been playing music and he keeps waking. So she switched to the white noise, no more wakes. So what's happening is the music and the lullabies and the lights and the whatever you put in the crib to, you know, soothe them, which you're thinking is doing wonders for your child because it's not you who has to do it, it's a machine. Um, is busy in their brain more. And because newborns up until two years, their neurons are firing like crazy and everything they're like, the, everything is new to them. You know, the plant, the wall, the people, they can barely see until, you know, four or five months. Everything is new and they're stimulated so much and they're processing so much that at night when they sleep, the brain waves have to be calm. And that is what the white noise does. It is loud. It is boring. They won't hear the car horn. They won't hear, you know, mom making dinner. They won't hear dad on the phone, whatever it is. It's mm. to block everything out. And it's just another tool. Everyone in my household sleeps with one. Mm. Mm. And for, for our listeners, uh, how do we explain this white noise? I know people often... It's a fan. It's, yeah. you know, in, J in Jamaica, when I grew up, I had the air conditions. So the air mm -hmm. condition was loud and it drowned out everything. And it's soothing like an airplane when you're on the airplane. Mm -hmm. um, and so I always, even when my family moved to Seattle, Washington, it was cold, cold. And I had the AC because I had to have the noise. Mm -hmm. Now my whole family's ruined. So we have a fan. So my mother comes to visit. And even though we have central air, she needs the fan blowing because she needs the noise. And what it does is blocks out everything. And it's lovely. I don't hear the dog barking or the train or whatever it is. And if my child really needs me, I can hear that through, you know, the monitor or she'll come to me. But if you're not going to hear, especially for new parents who I'm working with, um, a client of mine just got one for herself after I worked with her because now she won't hear the sneezes. 
um, the fussy like rollovers and she used to jump up. She'll hear if there's crying and the baby needs her, but now she's sleeping mm. because those little things, you know, I can hear my child cough when my husband's fast asleep and they're down the hall and I leap up. So if, with moms, you're just attuned to everything. So the white noise is used to just block out all the busyness and calm your brain. And it's very helpful. Even people, there was a study that showed in offices, they use it now. Yeah. And a lot of humans uh, have sleep deprivation. So maybe they can also try the white noise as well to get some sleep, especially our new moms. But oh, yeah, I'm it's just kind of like that. Yeah. I can't wait. If I wake up in the morning and the alarm goes off, but the white noise is still on, I'm asleep. I have to turn it off. And then I hear the world and I'm like, oh, I guess I'm getting up. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trained. Uh, you are trained and more moms need to try it out. I, I definitely agree. So it's that one big static sound. It kind of contains like all frequencies and it yeah. has been proven. You want a fan sound. You want, a fan. There's lots of, there's lots of, um, ones on the market mm -hmm. but there's one in specific which is like on my website and my instagram that i that i partner have partnered with and they have a real fan inside the machine so you're actually listening to the fan not like a mechanical noise so get a fan buy you know a fan at the pharmacy plug it in that works just fine you just want still boring consistent sounds and as Kristen just said, it has been proven by many researchers and, uh, you know, sleep experts, I should say, that it works for children and adults. Yep. There's another thing now, Kristen, oh my goodness, when the baby is teething and we don't know what to do, the baby is cranky, the baby won't sleep and we're all freaking out. We're like, help, I need sleep, I need sleep. Mm -hmm. What do we do to help our baby who is teething and not sleeping so I tell everybody teething is the enemy of sleep it is the worst teething and sickness and so I I have to tell my clients to give yourself grace because your child isn't a robot just like we aren't you know we have good nights bad nights we're like oh we slept great oh that was awful um, <clears throat> and I tell them 80 percent of the time if they do what we want them to do we're winning 20% of the time, there's room for shots and developmental milestones and sickness and teeth. And when it comes to those things, what I tell my clients, if they have a slip, you know, if their child is already sleep trained, then they know the skill. And when a time comes like that, where the teeth are coming in, you need the child to sleep no matter what. So I say all bets are off. If, you, if they need to sleep on you in the rocking chair, if they need to sleep in the car, if you need, if it's like, you know, a two-year-old and you need to sleep in the bed next to them, I say do it because getting the sleep is so important because if you don't keep up with the sleep, you now have a teething and overtired child. And it's better to fight through the three to five days of the tooth hurting and getting them to sleep. So at least you're not really pushing them to the edge and just suck it up and say, all right, you can sleep on me in the rocking chair, then I'll lay you down and whatever you have to do. I say all bets are off for that. And people fear that because the child has done so well and learned the skill um, on self-soothing. They always think they're going to unlearn it. And I say, no, because what you have given them is the gift of sleep and they learn their body loves it. Yeah. And so once it comes back and they don't have the pain and they're going to want to go back in their bed and they're going to want to do their good naps and their good night sleep. So I just have to tell parents, give yourself grace, suck it up for the time it's there. Once it's done, you'll bounce right back. Yes, that's a good one. What about bath time? Is bath time important for children to sleep? How many times should we wipe them down and bathe them, especially our newborns who are sleeping every 60, mm -hmm. 60 minutes? Mm -hmm. So for newborns, I'm not as keen or I'm not as forceful on doing the bath. I'm just saying, you know, you're trying to survive and you're trying to get through the, the fourth trimester where you're just learning everything. Um, so baths are great if you have time, especially before bed. I know Jamaicans love to have like two or three baths in the day. I'm like, she's bathing again. They're like, yeah, we bathe all the time. Um, so that's fine. And to me, as they age, you know, four months and on, it's a great activity. It's great for their sensory. They love doing it. It's calming. Before bed, 
I, I recommend it as one of those cues that you see uh, mm -hmm. that I was mentioning earlier that, um, you know, the lights are now off. We're going to our bath. We've got our milk. We've done all these different cues. And so I see it as just another cue for the baby. Of course, it's important for cleanliness as they age and the milk is all down the neck and they're sweaty and all this. Um, so it is important for cleanliness, but I also think it's a great cue. And in my in the bat, the bed, the forgive me, in the bedtime routine that I made, bath is in there. It starts with a feed, which most people think it should end with because Jamaicans especially love to top up and give the baby milk and put them to bed because they'll sleep with a full belly. But that's all, you should be doing that completely opposite. The feed should come when they wake up, not when they go to bed. And then the bath falls in there and then write, you know, stories, prayers, songs, whatever you need to do. And then you leave them. Ah, what about, um, I was going to ask you about the light in the room, you oh, know? Yeah. So, yeah. Sometimes we're in, a, we're in environments where the television is on. And as you mentioned earlier, no devices. I mean, we need to keep the room quiet, preferably a white noise, but what about light and sleep, especially in the day for our newborns? Okay, so I don't want to bore you with the science of it. But I love the science. You can bore us. We need the science. Yes, we love the science. <laughs> so um, in the early, early newborn days, you have to teach them day from night. Their circadian rhythm is not developed. So they're not going to, you can't just do what you do and expect them to know day from night. You know, I have clients that are like, my baby's awake all night and asleep in the day. And I'm like, uh-oh, like we got to reverse um, and so that's just what happens because those new mothers are so desperate just for them to sleep. So they're like, oh, thank God they're asleep. I don't care when it is. I don't care where it is. Just sleep. Um, so what happens in a child and in us as well is between the hours of 3 p.m. to about 6 p.m., our body starts creating melatonin. And this is after you have now trained your child, at least fix the day to night confusion. And they will start producing their melatonin at the same time we do, which is the hormone that makes us want to sleep. Now, light, when we our eyes are open and we interact and we are stimulated by any light, cortisol is produced. And that's the hormone that wakes you up. So if your baby is sleeping soundly, and they roll over at the end of their sleep cycle and they open their eyes just you know, to roll over like we do in bed and they see the light, it will start immediately producing cortisol, which means their melatonin is being knocked out. So the light won't wake them if they're asleep, but if they happen to wake and roll and see it, then you're in trouble. So a lot of people can get away with sleeping uh, with babies sleeping in the light. And that's great because they've learned to love sleep and it's fine. And they can connect the cycles of their sleep without waking up. So they don't need to see it. They'll sleep through it. But for the most part, I tell parents, even like my children have black garbage bags taped on their window upstairs mm. underneath their curtains. So no one knows that, but if they were to open them, it would just, it would be amazing. It's just black. Um, because I don't want to risk it. I want them to wake when I wake them. So they're pretty good. They have their circadian rhythm down, but I tell clients who think it's dark and I don't care if you have blackout garbage bags for the rest of your life or just for the process of sleep training, you can do either. But when you're trying to teach them and build their circadian rhythm, you have to help them with darkness and light. So I tell parents, get the garbage bags, put them up when they're sleeping. That's the room they're sleeping in, or that's the area they're sleeping with where no light is coming in. Once they're awake, pull them out to the living room, pull them by the window, walk them outside, show them and their, their body will start to connect and say, okay, this is what happens in the dark. And this is what happens in the light. And it's very, very important because of the scientific reasons I told you. I mean, even for us, if I take a nap in a light room or on the beach, I'm not going to sleep five hours like I would in the dark. So we're looking at the light and the dark. So if you have garbage bags, make it work. Make That's it all work. you need. A yeah. black candle bag, anything, a blanket, a towel, just help them 
you know, build their circadian rhythm. They need that help. They don't know it just automatically. Mm. So a lot of this is evidence-based, some of the tips that yeah. you're sharing with us, Kristen. And as you said, when you were pregnant, you read a lot about this. So mm -hmm. you've been giving advice. You've had some very successful um, uh, cases with some of your clients. And I'm so happy that you've been able to share some of that with us. There's something I want to look at, and it's safety for children and how feeling safe and secure helps a baby sleep and looking at some of the activities activities that may be happening in the community, the society, the home, there are children who are being born into domestic violence homes. Seeing this, how does this affect them scientifically? And what, what, what have you seen and what advice can you give to moms, dads, communities prone to violence and how it affects their children and their baby's sleep? And tell us as well, if a baby gets little sleep, not enough sleep, how does it affect them later on in life? So I'm so glad you asked that. Um, children need sleep. There is evidence that they um, later on in life will have anxiety, have focusing problems in school, weight gain, um, you know, need to be medicated for various things that they would not have needed to be medicated for. Anxiety is a huge one. And I'm sure that we can all relate as adults who don't sleep. I mean, how do we feel when we don't sleep? Um, with children who don't feel safe, the parent needs to step up. Like the training process needs to be a handholding event. So if I was to work with a client who I felt the child didn't feel safe, um, I would have the parent have a much more hands-on or the caregiver um, role because children know. And a lot of parents think that if they leave their baby to just cry, that it's like, you know, it's abandoning. And I want to say that it will not scar them for the rest of their life, but that is not the way to do it. What you need to build in your child is the reassurance that you will always come back. And that is the goal of my method that I use when I work with families. Um, you have to be as present as humanly possible, even through the sleep training. So if there was a plan that I wrote for a family um, that had little intervention, in the situation that you just described, I would have much more intervention. I would have you know, them physically there, emotionally there, because all children need is reassurance to feel safe. If you're gone for 20 minutes, great, but you always have to come back. And reassurance is the key trick to sleep training because once they feel safe and they're warm and they're fed and they their needs are met, they have very few needs. We just need to meet them. Um, they will be fine, um, especially in the sleeping environment. But definitely for, for families like that, that don't have, you know, as much safety, you know, in the community and stuff like that, the parents are going to need to be as present as possible because until the age of two, your child thinks that they're another limb on you. It's only when they start becoming two, and that's why they kind of call it the terrible twos, because they're like fighting you back and saying no, and that's when they realize they're their own person around that age, 18 months to two. So until then, they think they're like an arm and leg, they're supposed to be with you. So that's why it's so important to make sure that you're present day and night. And that's what I would have to, you know, consult with whoever that family is to figure out how they can be most present, because that's the number one thing. It has to be you, it has to be the caretaker. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, let's look at one more thing that everybody <laughs> tries, and I was very deliberate and intentional with my second one, that I was not going to let that pacifier take over my life and oh. your life. Some people wouldn't call it the dummy in some countries, the sock sock. The pacifier. Yeah, there's so many, every, every time I talk to someone, I'm like, wait, what is that? And they're like, oh, it's a soother. It's the yes, soother. a soother. There's so many names for it. So I grew up saying soother. So it's so funny when they have all these different names for it. Yeah. So, so tell they, me now. Yeah. So in, until six months old, a child has an insatiable need to soak. 
So if they are sucking their hand, people say, oh, they're hungry or they're sucking your shoulder or they're biting your shirt. It doesn't mean they're hungry. They have to suck. It, they cannot help it. So I gave my child a pacifier as she came out. I know there's so many people wait for four weeks or, you know, don't give a bottle for a certain amount of time because of, you know, whatever their reasons are. Um, and that's fine. Everybody do you. But according to my research and my studies and my certification and my professional opinion, I don't mind a soother if they can do it themselves. So for instance, the client I was just with in Jamaica, the baby cannot sleep without a pacifier, but the baby cannot put it in herself. So every time we were working on the program, we would have to go in and put the pacifier back in. And that is called a sleep crutch. A sleep crutch is something that the baby needs that she cannot or he cannot do himself. He cannot, you know, he needs intervention. So I don't mind a pacifier. Don't do what I did and wait till three to break it because they can speak and they are angry. Yes, and that is what I meant. Like mine, I had to throw them all away. Mm -hmm. This kid, my firstborn, was going crazy for the pacifier. To, I think two, and I was like, no, this is it. And when you yeah. can't find it, they throw the tantrums, and I'm just like, this is it. Day and night, I'm done. So it I had to a just you problem. Throw it out. Yes, that's when it becomes a you problem, and you don't want to deal with it. My mother told me at one that the rat ate it, and <laughs> I, I guess I just moved on. Um, which I think is kind of the sweet spot at one, because you can, you know, take them to get a stuffy, get something else to replace it. Oh, so-and-so had a new baby. Let's give them your pacifier. You know, there's different tricks that they're still in that sweet spot at one years old. I have people who call me at like two or three and they're like, my baby's fighting me. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it's just something you're going to have to do. And it's hard for a lot of parents because especially new parents, because you don't understand that this is the least of your problems. They're going to fight you on things as they age and grow. This is your first battle. So, you know, gear up for it, but it does so become a you problem when they're older. Right. But you're saying that for some children, it can, the suck, suck, the soother, the pacifier, the dummy, whatever it's called, mm -hmm. where you are listening right now, listeners, it can yes. be used as a sleep aid, right? Yes, because it's a, it is something that they can recreate themselves. So that, for instance, the baby that I said, we had to keep going in and putting it in. After our time together, we had two, three days together. By day three, she had figured out how to roll back to front and how to put the pacifier in. Because if she wanted it bad enough, she was gonna figure it out. And we watched her try and put it in backwards and everything. And, and then we would have to go in and help and intervene. Yeah. Um, and so when she did it, great, I don't care. She can have it then. At one, maybe at one, when she's still young enough to not fight you as much, um, I would get rid of it and you know replace it with a stuffy or some lovey or something else that she can hold that's tangible. Um, but if she can figure it out, great. I had another client who was like, I can't, I have to give it to them. I have to give it to them. And I was like, okay, you go, go ahead. I'm not going to fight you on it, but just know that you'll be doing that four or five times a night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think final thing, Kristen, one thing that bothers a lot of moms and something that we've recognized is that a lot of babies suck their thumb or their fingers, as you said, they, it is a natural thing for them to do, but mm -hmm. it does help a lot of them to sleep better with less uh, night waking. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, that's great. When I talk about sleep crutches, um, things like rocking, sucking the thumb, swaying, driving, strollering, walking, whatever you want to do. Um, that's great. Um, until you know they need to recreate it and they can and that's what happens with sleep crutches in general it's like us falling asleep in our bed as an adult and waking up on the bathroom floor and that's how, imagine how startling that would be that is what they are going through when they fell asleep in the stroller and woke up in the bed that's why they're, they're screaming because they don't they don't know how they got there that's why putting them down and having them fall asleep on their own once they wake they roll over and they're like oh I know where I am this is great I'll go back to bed. But yes, the sleep crutches are hard to break. The sooner you break them, the better. The hardest one is food. Mm. If your baby is falling asleep eating, 
you're in trouble because it's a physical reaction. It's their body's digesting and the melatonin is being produced at the same time. And they're going to need both those things if they want to sleep versus rocking, sucking the thumb, something that's easily broken. The food is insanely hard to break. And when do we break the sleep crutch? Um, and you, how do we break it? I, I think that you kind of see what works for you. When mm -hmm. your child is 16 weeks gestational from their due date, you know, so I've had clients call me and they're like, I'm ready to train. And I'm like, You're, it's, they were born early. I need more, they need more time. You want to give them a fair shot. Um, that's when we break them is when we, when we train. They are now cognitively able to self-soothe themselves. And so what you're going to do in the process is teach them to self-soothe. So they're going to figure out what they need to fall asleep on their own without intervention. That is the job to put them down anywhere and have them fall asleep. I love this. All right. Final advice now to all of our moms listening right now to help them sleep better and their babies sleep better. Uh, let's look, take a look at some of your nuggets now. Give them a reminder of how to okay. get sleep. And mom <laughs> needs to sleep too. We must make sure our moms yes. understand yes. they need to rest as well. So my number one piece of advice that I tell everyone is progress, not perfection. You need to celebrate all of your wins, even if they're small. People feel defeated because they had a great first nap and then baby did not nap the second nap. And then the third nap was good. And they just feel like nothing's working. And you need to celebrate that this is a long road. Stay committed and you celebrate every win. I have families who feel so defeated because one night they slept all night, one night they woke up and it's just all gone. And I'm like, that's not how it works, we're humans. So progress, not perfection. The second thing, nugget, I say is to give yourself grace and to ask for help because we cannot do it alone especially having a first child, probably harder even having your second child and, you know, doing this alone. And that's why I'm here. That's why you have your village. That's why, you know, people want to help. You just have to ask. Don't think you can do it all alone because once you get the help you need, you will have those pockets of rest that you need to, you know, you can't pour from an empty well. So you need to ask for help. This is excellent advice. Thank you so much. How do we find you if we need that expert help now? Uh, so when we're doing Instagram. it, working. Go ahead, I'm on Kristen. Instagram with my name, Kristen Giefer. Easy to find. And I, my website is the same, kristengiefer.com. And it has and wonderful information that's free, blog posts, guides, everything that you need under the sun because, you know, that's I need to get you to a good place. It's my job. So it's kristengiefer.com and Giefer is G-I-E-F-E-R. That's how you spell yep. it. <laughs> Got it. All right, mommy. Well, enjoy mothering. And I think it's always important to ask a couple, couple of things. What has been the hardest part of being a mom, even though you have all of the data, you have the skill set, you have the experience as a pediatric sleep mom, I should say expert pediatric sleep consultant, what has been the hardest part for you? And what is the biggest personal lesson that you have learned as a mom? Wow. I know, um, right? <laughs> loaded. <laughs> loaded question. What am I allowed to say on, you know, <laughs> live radio? Um, the hardest part is probably I struggle with my patience. So when I was a teacher, I knew they were going home at the end of the day so I could do it. These guys are here all year long. So I struggle in especially expecting a lot of things from them that they can't give. And I find that, you know, I say, do this, do that, do that. And they're like, I can't, I can't manage. And you kind of forget that they're little. And I have to remind myself, I'm like, they're such big girls, you know, they're, they're going to school and they're this and they're that. And they're little still, they're so little. And I tell that to clients who are like, why aren't they doing this? And I'm like, they're five months old. And so I'm really focused. And I have been this year was a big focus for me is remembering they're little and treating them like they're little and, you know, not saying things like, how can you not understand what I'm asking you? 
And you're like, come on, are you a Martian? <laughs> and so <laughs> they don't get it. And they're still, they're just processing and being stimulated, just like the little ones that I work with. And then what was my next question again? And that was some of the hardest moments and some of the most rewarding moments that you have had with your children. I love a baby and I would have 10 babies. And when I wanted another one, my OB said, do you want a baby? What if a four-year-old came out? And I was like, oh God, no, I want a baby. <laughs> she said, you're done having children. It's the babies. And this was a huge misconception for me because I love them as they age. They are so fun. And I thought like, oh, I'm going to have, you know, toddlers and then I'm going to have school age kids. And I am shocked to find that they are so fun. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I'm, of course, I miss them as a baby. Um, but I, my mother-in-law said they get fun, more fun every age. They're in high school. You can travel with them. They can have a conversation and all this. And I was like, what? No, I just want my babies. <laughs> and now it's fascinating to sit and talk to them and hear what they're thinking and hear how they see the world. And that is I love every minute of that, you know, the car ride from school. What did you do? Who did you talk to? You know, all that stuff. And I'm fascinated by what they say. So yeah. I think that was a big misconception on my part. And I find it so rewarding to watch them grow. That is so true. Kristen, thank you so much for being here. And I wish you and your children a great year. And for all thank the moms you. who need a sleep coach, this is your lady, Kristen Giefer. Check her out on social media. Check her website out. And she has a lot of material there for you to read through. All right. And make sure that you are sleeping better and the babies are sleeping better. Thanks, Kristen. Thank, thank you for having me. It was wonderful. Thank you. The Caribbean Moms.com podcast is brought to you by Lactogen 3 for a healthy and happy tummy. Lactogen 3, grow happy. Lactogen 3 is not a breast milk substitute. It is suited to young children from one year onward. And remember, breastfeeding is best.